accessibility, and that's because in my day job I make blockchain standards for businesses. Uh, but I have spent quite a long time working on accessibility standards. How many people have an idea of what accessibility is and means? Anyone who's in here? A few, two or three? Quite a few. How many people have heard of, I don't know, say a, a Disability Discrimination Act or a law against discrimination? A few. Um, how many people have heard of WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines? Quite a lot. So the really interesting question, how many people here develop services, like actually write code or run tests for services for people out there in the wilds? And, and how many people commission those services? How many people send someone else off with a set of specs or requirements or go out and buy something. This includes for your employees, right? And, if you, um, and, and how many people use those services? How many people here use online services because they haven't got a choice of some kind or other? Right? So I guess a lot of this will not be rocket surgery. Me it will, I need to learn simple things like how to use the keyboard. So why am I here to talk about what it is? Mostly to talk about what does it do, what does it look like, what can we solve, how can we do it? And then I want to leave actually a fair bit of time at the end. If you have a question in the middle, just stick up your hand and interrupt me, because life is more interesting now and you get your question answered. So, accessibility is making stuff work, right? making sure people can do it. And, and in particular, in the way it's often used by people around the web, it means enabling people to do stuff whether or not they have a disability. Right? Because that's the basic idea. I mean, if you, if you go out and commission a service or if you build a piece of software, how many people will say, but you know, people who speak Hungarian or are female can't use this? Right? And that, that's just not okay. Right? So if you buy a piece of software or you build a piece of software and you say, but people with a disability can't use this, that's just not okay. Sure. Assuming that you can actually deal with the problems. And that's the key thing. So how, how does accessibility happen? I'll, I'll read the slides out. Just One, you anticipate barriers that people will face and you remove them. Or as Pink Floyd saying, tear down the wall. And the other one is, you don't create new barriers. Or, or as Redgum said, Prevention is better than a cure. So, what kind of disabilities do people have? And in particular, what kind of disabilities affect people using online services, digital services? This is a question. It's a quiz. Anyone got an idea? I guess? Seeing. Seeing. Color blind. Color blind. Deafness, hearing. <coughs> Difficulty moving. I, I don't know. I, I was watching, you know, because I'm that kind of person, boxing in a bar on TV and thinking about Muhammad Ali, who was once a great sportsman, but many people's image of Muhammad Ali is a shuffling man trying to light a fire, right? It happens to lots of people. So, I have an image which is Eurostat's best guess at the prevalence of different kinds of disabilities. Um, I won't read it out now because you can have the slides later and it's all described in the slides. Uh, but, dyslexia, people having difficulty reading, that, that's a pretty big deal, especially when you 
look at organisations that put out very text-rich <coughs> content. Difficulty with precision movement. Limited hearing or none at all. And, and those two things we will look at more. Low vision and low vision. Difficulty concentrating. Difficulty remembering stuff. That affects me when I sit in a closed in room with no windows and someone just drones on and on and on. So you'll be able to relate to that. How common are disabilities? How many people does this really affect? Because that's a big question when you're justifying spending someone's money, my money, your money, on a service for other people. It's like, is it worth it? So I, I get this question a lot and I despise it for two reasons. One is, you know, it's, it's not about how many people have a disability. It's about you're providing a public service, so serve the public. And two is, because I don't know the answer and no one else does either. And that's really embarrassing. So, really, no one's got a clue. If you look at the statistics that run around, you will find people saying somewhere between two or three percent to twenty-five or thirty percent, and, and and these are reputable people who actually do serious work and try and figure it out. Um, yeah, the Eurostat thing that I showed in my last slide said fourteen percent of Europeans aged fifteen to sixty-four have a disability, although they didn't ask whether anyone had problems reading, which you know, might be a mistake if you're thinking about what the issues are. So the numbers are kind of woolly at best, and that's one of the reasons why I don't bother getting very excited about them. But when you, you come to do work, we want to fix these things. Obviously, I hope, different disabilities, create different kinds of problems. Low vision is not the same as no vision. People who can see, you know, I, I have a problem, I have a problem with this booklet that shows me where all the things are, which is that the string it's on is too short and I cannot read it. I, I had a friend, a housemate, who had a problem with every book, which was that his nose was too long. <laughs> And as he tried to put his eyes onto the page to read the words, his nose sort of held it away from him. <coughs> People who cannot see at all have a different set of issues. Um, so a couple of odd, you know, obvious things. When people zoom stuff, how big, how big do people with low vision make their screen? 500% is trivial. There are a lot of people who do that. A thousand percent. Zooming anything up ten times. Having you know, maybe three or four words on your screen. Many people will do that. Can we deal with that? Maybe. So, so what kind of vision disability do people have? I took an example of a map of a bit of Brussels and applied a colorblind filter that, that simulates roughly, I forget the exact word, but triton colorblindness, three color colorblindness, and the whole map just comes out a big yellow blur, which makes it quite hard to see what's going on. It's not impossible, it's just frustrating. But other people have a different view of the same picture. In, in this one, just the middle of the field of vision is actually available and sort of kind of. There are people with exactly the opposite issue. Just the edges are there and the middle is gone. And there are various other ways that things look to people. So what do people do when they're faced with a problem like this? What do people do when they have some vision but it's got spots or blotches or bits missing. They, 
they take the thing off and they move it further away. Right? Or, or they hold their nose up to the book. They use a, a zoom on their screen. They make things bigger or smaller so that they can get the piece that they want into their field of vision. If you can't see the middle, you shrink this picture down so it fits in one corner and you can get an overview of what it looks like. And then you can make it grow and you can expand, you can explore around to see the bit you're interested in because you have an overview. If you can't see it all, you don't do that. But vision disabilities are not like hearing disabilities in, in all kinds of ways. And one is that most people you know, who have vision, some vision, will try and make it work. There are, I count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 people out of 40 or 50, probably 40 tops in here, wearing glasses. It's just normal. So, so a quarter of us have some device just to help us see. A lot of people who don't hear very well, or even who don't hear at all, do nothing about it. My dad, he thinks he can hear. He says, yes, dad, I'm sure you can hear. People who grow up with sign language, their parents sometimes go and you know, put a bionic ear in their head and they can hear, and they can. It works, it's an amazing piece of technology. But a lot of people who use sign language as their main language don't think of that as a disability. They think of it as another language, in the same way that a lot of people who speak Hungarian, amazingly enough, don't think of that as a disability either. <laughs> and they learn another language as well. The difference between sign language and Hungarian is that Hungarian has structures which are quite a lot like other languages. Sign languages are actually quite different in the way they work. And that means that the things that you express and the things you can express are different. Put that difference as your native language together with the fact that you can't write your native language. People don't write sign language. And then take a system of communication which says, we're going to mimic somehow or other a set of sounds, which obviously you can't hear because that's why you use sign language. And then say, and now you have to learn how to use that language. It's actually pretty tough. People do it, you know, lots and lots of people because there are lots of people who work hard or are clever or just get beaten up in school until they learn. But there are different ways that people deal with these things. And so, I was told not to put this quote in, and so I did. You've, you've met one person on the autism spectrum, now you know about one person on the autism spectrum. This is Jamie Knight, who's a, a BBC engineer. He, he was the guy who made the International Space Station count as part of Britain so that British astronauts could watch Doctor Who on iView. Because he thought that was interesting. He's, as he will tell you, very seriously autistic in a number of ways. He has really big challenges with life. But he's a very smart guy and does stuff. Dyslexia is probably the most common disability there is because the numbers are so woolly, it's a bit hard to be sure, but it is really common. And many disabilities have a different impact over time, both over the course of your life and over the course of your day. People who can do stuff in the morning, can't do stuff in the evening, vice versa. These are all things to think about as you think your way through what are we doing? What are we building for people? And how does it have to work? How does it have to help them? So, Ronald Reagan, one of 
the world's greatest actors, if you exclude sort of all the other actors, stood outside the Berlin Wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. How? Also, there's a prize for the first person who guesses my next inspirational quote from a politician. So think about some concrete things. For people who have dyslexia, and there's lots of them, write clearly and simply and directly. This, of course, is what the European Union is famous for, right? You laugh, and so do I, because uh, I've, I've read lots of stuff. But there are people around the European Union and the Commission and the European Parliament and various other places who know how to do this, who work on it for a living and who do it very successfully. So if you're producing great screeds of complicated text and you're not talking to them, you're probably doing something wrong. It turns out that not only people with dyslexia appreciate this, but and again, people with people who speak Hungarian and believe that's not a disability, because um, it's not, but it makes reading big long blobs of English text a challenge. Provide helpful illustration. Use layout. Don't put great whopping chunks of paragraphs one after the other, like you know, the, the most horrible textbook you ever had to read in school. Because for a lot of people, that in itself makes things hard. If stuff is reasonably spaced out, then they get a sense of this is not some confronting monstrous pile of text. I get lost halfway down a page of a book. That's why, that's why people read with their fingers. So don't do that. Minimize distractions. This, this is a huge one. How many people have been to a bar and sat talking to someone who sat there staring at the TV flickering in the corner? Has anyone had that experience? Because <coughs> I'm that person. I'm the person who doesn't matter what's happening. It's like, look, it's moving. You're much more interesting than you know, an ad for boxing. But I can't turn my eyes away from it anyway. And so, and as you of course have already realized, because you're all smart people, we're all smart people, right? You don't get to come here if you're not reasonably smart. So this is just basic good quality. What sort of things do you need to think about for people who have mobility issues, who have control issues of what they can do? And again, clearly separate stuff, which I actually just said in the last slide as well, so that people aren't trying to judge that fine gap between two tiny dots that they can barely see because they're also usually wearing glasses, but they left them at home or, or in the bar with the boxing gloves. Make stuff big enough for touch screens. If you have a, a touch screen, if you've got a nice, shiny Apple Retina screen and everything is super, super tiny, it can be hard to read. It's really hard to actually put my big fat finger on top of the one thing I want on a lot of the web, and I have a reasonably high degree of motor control. For people who don't, that just frustrates them. It does sell voice control technology. It forces people who have, say, mild cerebral palsy, or mild Parkinson's, or any other condition that has a mild effect to go out and get tools and use things that they shouldn't need. Because 
we can build stuff this way. This is not high class, super technical engineering. Right? This is basic thinking. Give people time to respond. I, uh, I was reviewing a tool from my company yesterday. It's an internal tool in an internal release to check what sort of issues there are. And one of the issues was that this information appears and it moves around as the world changes. It shows you the updated state of the world. So there's no time to actually find the thing you want and look at it. It just runs away with that. And again, this is for someone who doesn't have a lot of you know, physical control issues. So it's, it's not a problem that's unique to people with disabilities. It's simple. But really, think, how does a, how does a one switch interface work? Because there are a whole bunch of people who have a computer that they drive essentially with one button. <coughs> what would you do if you only had one button and you had to get around a page? How would you expect someone to do that? So, slowly, that is absolutely likely. They will do it more slowly than other people. I can scan a page like that pretty easily. If it's got 15 buttons, I can poke them. If you've got one button, somehow or another, you're going to be you're pressing a button and letting a button go and moving around and aiming into where you go. Eye tracking control, which is now much more common because computers have a little camera that's looking at you anyway, and it's a good enough camera that they can follow your eyes, so they can figure out what you're doing, and the same sort of thing. That's quicker than one switch, uh, sometimes it's very, very quick, often it's not. Good for finding you know, a quarter of a screen, bad for typing. Japanese. Remove barriers for the deaf, for the hearing impaired. Write clearly, simply, and directly. See, there's a pattern. I did say that a lot of disabilities have very different impacts on people, but there are actually a lot of patterns. There's a lot of things where Making stuff work nicely and simply helps all kinds of different people, including people with disabilities. Background noise. Background noise is my pet hate in everything audio I do, because I don't hear that well, like my dad. And I don't have a hearing aid, like my dad. And I think I'm fine. <laughs> what I do love is people who provide transcripts. I, I don't know any sign languages. There are lots of sign languages I know of. Multiple sign languages used by people who live in English-speaking communities, but they can't communicate to each other because ASL, the American Sign Language, and Auslan, the Australian Sign Language, are related in the same way that Chinese is related to Hungarian, which is to say it's a means of expressing information. Uh, they don't share. ASL is basically one hand, Auslan is two hand, just for a start. Transcripts are great, because it takes me a long time to listen to stuff and I find it hard, and I get distracted, and transcripts are searchable and scannable, and I can present them in any way I want. I can make them bigger and smaller and easier and harder to read and change the colors and do cool things. So please, 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 always, always, always do transcripts. That will make me very happy. And remember, Beethoven was not the only deaf musician.
stuff for people with low vision, stuff for people with no vision. Some of these things cross over. Why does a blind, a completely blind user with no vision care about the contrast on your screen? But they don't. Because, well, you know, if you can't see it, it's not that interesting. Um, but having descriptions of images, appropriate descriptions, the right description for the context, for the way people are going to be using the image, and the right description is sometimes just leave it out. It was something that some designer said we should have this in here, and it doesn't add anything and it doesn't help. Sometimes people still want to be able to find a description of that image because they're doing a slide set and they need to put an image in it and they want to know if they've got the right one. Audio descriptions for video. These things help people with low vision because low vision is such a variable thing. Sometimes I can see it and sometimes I can't. Sometimes the picture is very clear. It was also not some amazing mashup of lots of things that I don't understand. It was a nice, clear, simple graphic. Sometimes I have no idea what's going on in this infographic, but the only thing I don't get out of it is information because I don't understand and I go look for the descriptions. If, if you have a problem seeing part of the image anyway, you will sometimes use that strategy and sometimes be happy that you don't have to bother. Complex layouts and complex, I've said here, threaded content, by which I mean things like conversations between 19 different people, you know, a, a typical chat channel where people are trying to answer things over the top of other people, a, a typical meeting discussion where everybody's talking over everybody else and then you made a transcript. It can be quite hard to follow if you can't orient yourself. Visually, when these things are presented, email threads that have had 15 replies and people put stuff in the middle. Visually, they're often marked out moderately clearly so that you can try and understand what's going on. If you're not getting those cues, then you get lost. And being lost is a pain. And one of the big things about a, a you know, user who can't see anything is they don't know what they can't see. Right? So, so if you've left off information in some way, they're not going to discover that by magic. They might discover it by you know, better experience and long practice of checking stuff really carefully four times. But that's not what we're aiming to provide. So this is not actually a quote by Ronald Reagan. Yeah, or at least as far as I know, yeah. but you know, I'm not a big fan of his. Uh, in fact, I'm not really a fan at all uh, of almost anything he did. But he did have Alzheimer's, and I'm certainly not a fan of that. It sucks. Low concentration, poor memory, Difficulty actually focusing on what you're doing because you're locked in a room, there's no air, and there's been no air for a week, and the same guy keeps on talking. These are commoner than you think. How many people remember the last five slides? Not me. <laughs> the one with Ronald Reagan might have been in it, but that might be six slides ago. Can't tell you. You don't have to remember it. There's lots and lots of information out there. Not only are there professionals who can write stuff clearly, 
simply and straightforwardly. There are people who know about what you need to do when you present images. There are tools that will tell you if you've put enough contrast into two different things so that most people will be able to work with that picture. There are tools that will tell you if you've used the right set of colors so that people who are colorblind, colorblindness is a number that's reasonably well established. Does anyone want to guess what it is? Prevalence of colorblindness? Sorry? Uh, a bit less than five globally, like three to four, in, for various reasons, in white males, it's particularly common, it's above 10%, 11 to 12%. Uh, is there a colour blind in here? No? Has everyone been tested for colour blindness? <laughs> well, it doesn't always happen, right? You find people who, who don't realise they're colour blind because no one ever asked and you know, they figured the world was like that. As well as being like my dad, I, uh, I got my dad's eyes and when I was 27. I went to the optometrist and they put this thing on and flipped a bunch of lenses. And I thought, oh, well, that, that changes stuff. Got a pair of glasses, put them on, and I discovered that all my friends look like five or six years older than I thought. I don't wear glasses anymore. The world is nicer. <laughs> Repetition reinforces remembering. You don't have to remember this stuff now, you can go and read it. There's documentation, there's lots of places you can find out. If you're not looking for it, and you don't know it, and you're producing some kind of digital service, you're probably doing something wrong. But there are people, there are tools, there's lots of different resources. So, does accessibility work? Does what you built? There are lots of tools that will check things. They're very helpful. <coughs> I've never met a tool that will actually give me you know, a clear and definitive answer to all of the things that I look for when I do an accessibility evaluation. Because some of those things are really hard. Yeah. Checking against your design requirements. You know, if you sat down to do something and then you don't measure whether you did what you thought you were doing. That just seems silly, right? And, and of course, when you design any set of requirements, accessibility is just you know, a part of it, right? Because people. And one of the things that you should bear in mind, last minute rewrites of your system to fix accessibility things that you found at the very end of your development cycle might work out really well. You know, I think it's a good policy to, to plan for that. The musical quote I didn't put, because it doesn't fit on this slide, which is the all-important criterion, sometime in the next 10,000 years, a comet's going to wipe out all trace of man. I'm banking on it coming before my end-of-year exam. It's not actually a good plan for particularly an organization that aims to serve the public beyond like, extra week. And rest assured that whatever you do, you'll still get it wrong. And I get it wrong, but part of that is because I'm sloppy and not always very clever. But I know that every single time there are things that I should improve. And if I give my stuff to someone else, after a while I'll say, hey, why didn't you do this? And I'll say, because uh, you know, I was sloppy, not thinking well. 
make sure that user feedback can actually drive improvements. It does seem simple. It does help. So I'm going to take a website, which is a very recent website. Has anyone seen this? The contract for the web? It was put out by the World Wide Web Foundation in partnership with a whole lot of other people. I wish I can get live because I have a web browser. And maybe internet. Here we are, I have internet. Principles for a contract for the web. Yeah. It's all about how people will do things. For example, governments will ensure everyone can connect to the internet. So, this is cool. It's like governments will ensure that every single person has a telephone in their house in you know, 1990. Which in you know, 10,000 houses in Adelaide, where all the people are deaf, is a complete waste of time and money. If you take this website, as a friend of mine who was originally slated to give this talk but declined, and inflicted me on you, and you're blind, as she is, and you try and sign up to these principles, as a blind person does, you can't. This, this is Sir Tim Berners-Lee's latest project, the World Wide Web Foundation, whose entire mission is to bring the web to everybody, and they got it wrong too. Everyone makes mistakes, because life is like that. In particular, you can't find the button. So, what do people do? Very often, people who are blind, you have a screen reader reading stuff out to them. They use the tab button and that just goes boing, 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 boing between all of the links and things on the page, all the active things. Uh, there are different things they will do. They'll also go through the headers. Uh, but if you do it on this page, you hit tab and it says something like link, a contract for the web, banner. I'm, I'm quoting this from the screen reader on my laptop. Link, Espanol. There was actually a hamburger menu on the web page that just got completely skipped. But if you can't see that it's there, you don't even know that you didn't get to it. You keep on going, link, sign on behalf of your organization, which is after the add your own name to this thing. So it turns out that we're happy for blind users to sign up their organization, but apparently we don't really care what they think. Or, or maybe that's not the real truth. The real truth is someone somewhere did a bad job and we should fix it. Link, contract, webfoundation.org. Link, image 11434wf logo cmyk opec sib.png. Can anyone tell me what that is? It is a logo of the web foundation. <laughs> and it's opaque, probably. I'm, I'm not sure in what sense it's opaque, uh, except that as a description of anything, it's a pretty opaque description. <laughs> That's what you actually get. If you're in the European Union and you go to a website, the first thing that comes up on nearly every website, except mine because I don't use cookies because I'm slack, is a thing saying by using this website, you're going to have to agree to take all the cookies we ever want to give you and take from you. Okay, and that does indeed come up in the European Union on this website. It takes 97 presses of the tab button to get there. It is literally the very last thing on the entire page and you can go through everything else in the site except maybe you know, 50 of the 100 odd logos that have more or less enlightening titles like blah 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 logo dot qfq.323.png without even knowing it exists. This, this is a privacy thing, right? 
you can argue about whether or not Europe did the right thing in insisting that that's how you, know, you are treated. But it would seem that if you're required to understand that this site uses cookies and give your consent to using cookies, it's reasonable to assume that actually that applies to all people, whether they speak English or can't see or <coughs> actually speak. I can pick up Maltese now. I know nothing about Maltese at all, but it sounds like fun. Unfortunately, I don't speak. So don't build a wall. Quick interlude, don't make a special accessible version. People do that. It's a terrible idea. Why? For lots and lots of reasons. The biggest one is it's really, 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 really hard to get it right. So you're doing all these other extra work on the thing that you should have been doing the work on to start with and you don't stand any better chance of getting it right. You might as well just stick with making what you have as accessible as you can make it. Also, you don't know if someone has disabilities. You don't know if someone with a disability is sharing something with someone without a disability. It's pretty hard to talk to your blind children about the thing where what you're dealing with has a completely different order and a completely different set of content from what they think, or vice versa. Also, maintenance. I don't know why people never, ever, ever manage to set up long-term maintenance plans that work, but like making accessibility mistakes, eventually the maintenance plan will fall over. So I'm going to work through a quick example in HTML. How many people know what HTML looks like? Most. Good. Here's a line of HTML in the middle of my slide. Button. On click. Do button task. Press me. There is indeed on this page that button. And if I press the button, I get a message because button task is to give me a message saying something I can't read. But from memory of something like, yeah, my button. Uh, lots of people today use nice JavaScript libraries to help them do their development. And those nice JavaScript libraries put something in like span, if you're lucky, span on click equals fake a button. This is the problem with the Web Foundation site. That's what they did. And this is fine if you have a mouse and you, or a touch screen and you put your finger on the button or you can put the mouse on the button. But the button's not announced to a user as a button. You can't get to the button from the keyboard. You can't click the button without a mouse. That can all be fixed. We can use role attribute, way area, a big chunk of HTML to do lots of cool stuff and fix up you know, fancy JavaScripted widgets and controls and nice things from the modern web so that things which are meant to be buttons are presented as if they were buttons and explained as if they were buttons. And we can add a little bit more old-fashioned HTML so you can actually get to the button with the keyboard and we can add a little bit more and you can actually make it work just like a button. So this six, seven, I forget, lines of code does almost as much as the original one line. You actually need some other code to make the button look visually like a button so people can find it. But people do that anyway because they want their buttons to look different. We can fix these things. So what are the limits of what, can we, what we can do? Well, what sort of things can we make accessible? Everything to everyone? 
Does anyone think that's the answer? Because I'm pretty sure it's not yet the answer. I run into problems doing things. What sort of things can we make accessible? Well, common application widgets. If you want to make a date controller, a date picker, so that when you go along and it says put your birthday in and you use some fancy widget to put your birthday in, can we make that accessible? Yep. It turns out it's probably about the hardest example of things that people actually use in, in web pages because calendars are hard. Calendars are actually really complicated. What, what is this year? Can anyone tell me? 2018. Exactly. Except when it's 4,500 and something, which is what it officially is in Israel, I think. Or I could do the maths, but I'm going to say around about 1,400, give or take a century or two, which is what a number of Muslim countries think it is. Or again, it's the year 40 odd of the Emperor of Japan. That's the official dating system. That, that's what government documents are dated by. Calendars need to understand stuff like that. They really are hard, but we can make them accessible. We can make them so people can figure out what's going on, understand where they are in the calendar and what the calendar can do. We can take fairly complicated you know, presentations of information giant messy tables full of stuff with headings and subheadings and sub boxes. You can actually make those things reasonably clear and accessible. There's plenty of tools, there's plenty of stuff in the web that allows you to understand how those things are put together. If you're using it right, if you just draw lots of numbers and then put colored backgrounds on it, I'll give you a hint. That's not make videos, and charts, and diagrams and images accessible. We can make graphic simulations accessible. Science experiments and pictures of traffic, how traffic works with actual interactivity and buttons on it so that you can explain to your children how to cross the road safely even though you can't see the thing that you're using to explain then, because you know, oddly enough, there's quite a lot of parents who think explaining to their kids how to cross the road is a useful thing to do. Who knew? We can make interactive video games accessible. That's hard. Yeah. Run around shooting people games, flying starship games. So, so where are the limits? Accessibility of visual, uh, of virtual reality. Augmented reality, of mixed reality, all of these something, something digital, something reality. It's kind of a work in progress. People are doing a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff that seems promising and seems like we can make it work. But there's not a very deep and widespread understanding in the developer community about how to do that. You will find it hard to get someone who can help you do that on a quick notice basis. A lot of content tools that support some accessibility, but very few of them are very good at it. There's a lot of tools where you have to go out and make an extra effort to put in some accessibility system or some accessibility plug-in or add on some stuff or you know, read the extra chapter that you have to write away and have them send you separately, because you know, separate but equal, right? before it actually works. The best automated testing of accessibility we have is kind of rudimentary and basic. There, there are areas like making a graphical simulation accessible. Often that's not very hard. Getting a tool that will tell you if you've done that right, good.
Good luck with that one. Find a person. And most certification, most training, if you go out and say, I want to find someone who is an accessibility expert, then what you actually should do is talk to people you know and trust and ask them who they know and trust and figure out you know, for yourself whether this person is like a bit shonky or is actually pretty good. Because most of the training and therefore, of course, most of the certification out there is still at a very basic level. The sort of stuff that every developer could do with their eyes shut in a week if they put their mind to it. I'm selling it a little bit short, but not a lot. So those are the limits. Most of the limits are actually in what tools do we have? Why is that? People who commission or work with accessibility, sorry, work with digital services, people who build digital services. How many of you are there again? Please raise your hands. Right up high. Right, right, right up high. So how many of you insist on accessibility testing being done properly? Quite a few. How many of you change vendors based on the fact that their tool doesn't support accessibility? We cannot change the vendor when we the machine. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is not about you, know, you are a good person or a bad person, right? but, but this is the problem. When there is no real push to make tools better or make them fail, people only make them better because they think it's an interesting technical challenge. Fortunately, it is an interesting technical challenge and people do make tools better. So my quick cheat sheet, don't add barriers. Big thing to think about, are you actually producing a demonstration of some exciting new technology to show off you know, the technology? Or are you trying to provide a service for people? Because a lot of problems that you see can be readily solved by answering that question thoughtfully. Yeah. And of course, use the right tools and use them properly. And, and remove barriers. And a lot of that, you don't really need a highly qualified engineer to tell you what to do. If, if you think about people, actual people who are going to use this thing that you're working with, that you're designing, that you're developing, there's an awful lot of stuff that becomes obvious pretty quickly. It's a, a simple habit. WCAG, which everyone has heard of, it's a good start. Why is there a WCAG 2.1? Because the WCAG 2.0, which we know and have lived with for 10 years, missed a whole lot of critical stuff. And some of it got into WCAG 2.1. It's, it's important to get the baseline right, but just getting the baseline right is not actually providing a particularly good experience. And you know, think before you start doing, and test what you built, and check that it works. So nobody guessed my other politician's statement. We are shuffling thus. Because I thought that was a cool thing to say. And we can do this. This is not rocket surgery, right? It's straightforward stuff for the most part. And for the rest of it, you, know, you get some technical person to do it for you. Someone who knows what they're doing. Because anyone who wants it can have these slides, because it's actually just one giant HTML web page. There's a bunch of links in here to things that you might want to go and follow up. Uh, don't take a photo because you can't click the link on your camera photo. Get a copy of the HTML where you can. Thank you. That's it. I, I put a couple of questions like, how will AI solve the problem? How will blockchain solve the problem? Blockchain solves all problems. <laughs> it makes goji berries taste good. Uh, you know, are the tools I use accessible? Where do I start? What if I can't do it all? What should I do? What should I focus on? 
there's lots and lots of things to think about. I'm hoping, since we've got 20 minutes, to torture you guys for at least 10 of those and get you to say what you're thinking, what question is in your head. One of those is a fine question to have. Uh, they're there because I hear them a lot, which means that they obviously keep coming up. Or you know, people aren't sure about the answer yet. You may have completely different questions. If you would like to run away, I actually don't mind if you get up and run right now. It's fine. In the front, yes. So my question is, uh, so I have two questions. So if you can um, comment uh, ARIA 1.1 and open practices 1.1, because um, it was mentioned very quickly during your presentation. Uh, and the second question is creating accessible uh, PDF forms. And is it better to uh, opt for the web forms uh, instead of uh, accessibility forms? So the first one, ARIA. How many people know what ARIA is? A few. ARIA is a bit of HTML. It was developed over a long, long time, like about 20 years, which is two-thirds of the history of HTML itself, that you can add into what was then you know, modern dynamic HTML. So that when you use JavaScript and so on to create new widgets, you want to create your own fancy buttons with butterflies that fly away, or you want to create you know, your own calendar, widget because those aren't or weren't part of HTML. You want to build a tab panel interface where you have three different tabs and you can click between them. Making those things accessible was very, very hard. And ARIA basically provides a way of labeling the pieces so that a screen reader user can be told what the piece is. If you know what the thing is you're dealing with, then you have an idea how it works. The re most recent version of ARIA is ARIA 1.1, which is called 1.1 because it's slightly better than 1.0, and it's the latest version that there is, I believe, and you should use it. There is also a document that goes with it, which describes authoring practices, and just to say, how should you use this? And if you are using ARIA, it's pretty useful to Said. <coughs> the reason for that is that document says basically what do an, an ARIA virtually only works with screen readers what do screen reader users expect as an interaction pattern here it is for all of these different kinds of widgets use this it, it doesn't inherently cover Starship controllers unfortunately but since those are mostly like levers and dials and sliders and buttons, you can still use them to make each of the pieces of the Starship controller accessible. The second question, I forgot. Creating forms. The people at Adobe will tell you that PDF can be made beautifully accessible. Um, I know people who have example, no vision, and use PDF as their format for everything because they love it. I hate it. Um, I just find it frustrating, endlessly frustrating for very many reasons. I would recommend you use HTML. Uh, other people will tell you different. I think that most people will say, yeah, it's easier to make HTML accessible. It's more widely accessible. Um, but like any field of expertise, if you get enough people in a room, you'll get some disagreement. Yeah, yeah I have another question. Yeah, yeah. About so, the testing, what would be your recommendations for accessibility testing? How should we go about that? How do you test? Uh, so first, you, know, you just check that you actually did the things you said you were setting up to do. Get a tool, get a piece of software, because having people do 
mindless repetitive stuff that software is really good at is a waste of your money and their time. People will end up making mistakes in the software part. So you run the software and things like Tenon, if that suits your Tenon as an API where you send your code out and it comes back with a report. Uh, Axe, which is an open source JavaScript library produced by DQ, one of the accessible, big accessibility companies. Site Improve from Denmark. Uh, there's another one. And I couldn't remember their name when I was putting together this presentation. And in my head, it kept coming out as Monsanto. And I'm pretty sure that's not it. Uh, but there are a number of people who make tools for testing. Amongst the links is a, link, a list of 120 testing tools. Uh, but do you think it's enough to use those tools? Or no. <laughs> no, it's not enough. Once you've run through the tools, and you, know, you need a little time to understand what the tools do or don't do, then you get a person to check the other things. There's two kinds of approach you take. One is if you have a person with a specific disability, they can tell you things that are painful. I had a blind friend look through this presentation and got back a pile of, uh, not abuse because she's very polite and very nice, uh, but notes about things that I should have thought about and got right the first time, uh, which I applied. But a blind user can't test for, is there something I cannot see? Um, so you actually need to think about who is doing the testing. There are companies who specialize in this who have armies of people who will do testing for you and charge you as much or as little as they can get away with. There are people who know what they're doing. There's lots of documentation out there that will help you get a better understanding. So I'm going to ask you about the question, how do you reason, how do you justify this there is sufficient level of accessibility for an application? I suppose that an application, an internal application that is used by 10 people, who you know who they are, has different requirements compared to a public website or, or a, the How, how do you justify and how do you decide when you've done enough and how do you do what you need to? That's kind of a hard question. I mean, how do you justify the, the design budget, or the graphics budget, or the usability budget of your tool? You know, there's no magic answer. There's no magic formula that says, well, obviously we should put you know, X percent of our resources into the graphic design. Somebody makes what boils down to a completely arbitrary decision about, yeah, this is sort of enough. There, there are some obvious objective measures. If you have an internal team of 10 people and you know them all, and one of them is a blind person and they can't use part of your system, you haven't done enough. And that's kind of simple. Uh, if you have a team and you don't have a blind person and you know that your system is inaccessible for a blind person, then the one thing you need to think of is if your team is ever going to grow and you are going to hire another person and you say, oh, we can't hire the blind person because we built this thing in such a way that we can't fix it even if we wanted to. probably get away with it, right? That's illegal, but you'll probably get away with it. But that sucks. You shouldn't do that. Just because, because. Right? If you're building a public, public service, you should, at a bare minimum, take the web content accessibility guidelines and meet every level A and every double A requirement in those because that's kind of the, the global baseline standard of this is what is acceptable in a civilized country. Uh, and people will say, yeah, except for that one, except for this one. 
there's, there's a related question I put up there, which is, where do I start? What do I do first? How do I prioritize? And the answer is, you do what you can. The, the thing you can do first, do it. Even if it's a AAA requirement. Even if it's something that's not actually in the web content guidelines, but you know it creates real problems, if you know how to fix it, just do it. How do you balance the rest of your budget? How do you balance the rest of your workflow? That's a task called management, and there are university degrees devoted to that. Yeah. So I don't have a, a great answer for you, except that the same way that you think about all of the other things you put in, the same way you think about the graphic design or about what level of service you're making available in the first place. Um, I think there's very few people now that will start with raw HTML when they're developing something. Everybody uses frameworks or libraries, and that seems to be where the solution has to come from. You know, accessibility has to be built into it. And I would say that if, if they put the same effort into that as they did for responsive design, you know, you detect the device, you adapt the screen to the device. They should have some way so that people can indicate their level of disability and you adapt the screen to their level of disability in the frameworks. That would be the way to go. Responsive design is something that actually came from, in large part, people who were thinking about accessibility in the 90s and was it was something that was built sort of hand in hand with really working out how to do accessibility well. And it supports a lot of accessibility stuff. That along with adapting to a specific device, responsive design is meant to adapt to specific user needs. And that's part of the whole idea. And, and that's exactly what accessibility is about, right? Um, finding out that somebody has a disability? Say, so, yeah, you know, I, I am in a wheelchair and have very limited mobility and I live in a nice house. So, so come and rob my house instead of the next door neighbors. I, I used to work delivering video cassette recorders. So people remember what they are. It's a kind of ancient technology, um, steam powered usually. They went out because we decided that burning coal was a stupid idea and would destroy the earth. Um, and I would regularly visit, I think every six months, a chap who said, it sucks being blind for two reasons. One is that recently the remote control became programmable and has a little screen. In the olden days I would get a video player and I put a video in and I would just press the buttons until I figured out how it worked because it had about nine buttons and I knew what the buttons would do and I could work it out. But I can't understand you know, this programmable thing which just stops responding because I don't know what it's waiting for and it's got 40 buttons. But it sucks more that somebody actually watches my house and comes and steals my video recorder about every five months. And I have insurance and they just buy me a new one. But it sucks that someone's walking in and stealing stuff from my house because they know I'm blind. Maybe he was mistaken. Maybe that no one was. You have no right to know whether someone has a disability. It's just that that's just part of our assumption about how the world works. On top of that, you don't actually have any need to know. So part of your suggestion is very, very right, that we should adapt stuff to users. Because we can. It's the way it's digital, it adapts to anything. And it should adapt to users, but it shouldn't adapt because you find out that someone has a disability. But this That's is what data protection is about. I and mean, if, if, yeah. if you, as a, as a service provider, I say, I promise to use this in a, in a, in a safe way, this is the, the contract between you as a service provider and you as a service consumer. And I think there are solutions to that. There, there, there are solutions. The, there are <clears throat> l largely, and, and I think it is the, the right way to approach the, 
question, the solutions are in, in the user's private space. So when your content gets to the user, they interact with their, their user agent, as accessibility people call browser, web people call browser. And, and in that space which they control, that's where the adaptation should happen, so that rather than the information leaking out all over the place. So, so that issue is, is actually you know, kind of important. And you know, privacy is important to people, security is important to people. Very, very often, privacy and security information fails the accessibility test. If you open up a browser, you, know, you go to a website and it says this website is insecure, it might be trying to steal stuff from you. It does that in a lot of ways. Uh, browsers have been doing that for, I guess, the best part of a decade and some. Um, and they've been making that accessible for the best part of two years. So, again, assuming that for one group of people, their privacy and their security is somehow different, it just, you don't have to is one key and you should. So, so yes, take, take the responsive design stuff, build your services so that they can be adapted when it comes to figuring out where the adaption should happen. You should really, really, really try hard to push that down so that it happens at the user's end and they deal with it and you don't you don't have that, apart from anything else, so that you don't have to manage that information. <coughs> Just managing information that you don't need is a pain. And it's not a good idea for lots and lots of reasons. But, but other than that little piece, yes, responsive design, 